They're actually just walking away saying, you know, even though we paid down the 20% deposit, we're just going to walk away. We'll, we'll eat that 20% loss. If you're a big pension fund, you're like, well, why am I going to build an apartment building and pay all these costs when I could just buy a, a 10 year uh, US T bill that's, uh, you know, got a 5% yield on it. I'm just stick all my money in bonds. Hi, and welcome to The Missing Middle. I'm Kara Stern. And I'm Mike Moffat. And today we're talking about why housing starts are so down right now and what that means for Canada's housing crisis. But before we get started, don't forget to like, subscribe, or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Politicians across Canada have set goals to double or even triple their housing starts. But the CMHC is predicting that housing starts will fall this year. And Mike, I know you've been all over Twitter and other social media platforms saying that things are actually going to be even worse this year than CMHC is saying, particularly in Ontario. Why are things so bleak? Yeah, it's uh, it's not looking good out there. It's funny we often hear about you know worries of uh, labor shortages and things like that in housing, but you know we're we're seeing layoffs in, in the sector, um, and we can look at you know divide the sector out into three parts. Uh, there's the condo market, the home ownership market, that's the the non condo part, and apartments. And two of those three markets are essentially dumpster fires right now. So, you know, that's kind of the issue that, you know, you look at these different subcomponents and things just aren't looking very good. You were showing me earlier some data that showed that housing starts in Ontario is down about 35 percent. And it's only been two years for those stats. How did things get so bad? Yeah, so if we look at the non-condo ownership market, it's been an absolute disaster. And, and to put this in perspective, it's fallen by more than 50% uh, over the last 20 years. So massive, massive decline. So these are, you know, your single detached homes, your your duplexes that you own. They're not, they're not a condo uh, that you outright own. These homes are exceptionally expensive to build. Land prices have gone up substantially. You know, there's not a lot of land available. Um, and the land that's out there tends to be in smaller communities or at the edge of town. Um, so the land is really expensive and development charges have gone up about like 2000 uh, percent in cities like Toronto over the last 20 years. So development charges are high. Um, land costs are expensive. So nobody can can really afford these homes. And, you know, the homeowner market has just collapsed with the, the rise in interest rate. And that's who buys these homes. It's not investors does, don't usually touch them. It's it's people who are going to be owner occupants occupiers live in these homes and you know homes are expensive and at interest rates these interest rates nobody's qualifying for a mortgage so this market which had already been in decline over the last 20 years it's just absolutely cratered in the last couple you say non-condo ownership so these are parts of the markets that are like houses townhouses anything would it be stacked townhouses anything like that yeah, it, it can be. Now, some of those stacked townhouses and row houses, some of them are structured as condos, some of them aren't. Uh, but yeah, it's it's those kinds of the, the markets. And, you know, and, and again, this this is a market that is really for uh, for homeowners in the sense that that's who's buying them again, because they tend to be in small communities, they tend to be at the edge of town, they don't really make for good rentals. If you want to buy a single detached home and rent it out to somebody, you're probably going to buy a you know 80 year old house that's near a college or a university or, or a transit line. So it's really sensitive to household finances and it's really sensitive to interest rates. So because of that, nobody can can really afford these places. The obvious question that comes to mind then is if they're too expensive that no one is buying them at the current prices, they should lower the prices and then people will like there's a price where someone will buy them. Right. Like, why isn't that happening? Okay, so we'll, we'll do a little Econ 101. And I think Econ 101 is, is dangerous in the housing market because there's a lot going on. And, you know, a, a, a con, you know, small condo is different than a McMansion and so on. So Econ 101 logic can break down a little bit. But 
here, I, I, I think it can actually be useful to think about. So if we treat this just as a, a, a reduction in demand because of interest rates, there's other stuff going on. But if we treat it just as a reduction in demand, we'll get out your little supply and demand graph. What happens when demand falls substantially is, yes, prices do fall. And we've seen that prices are, are down about 15 to 20 percent uh, euro um, since the, the height of the pandemic. But what you also see is the quantity sold or the quantity they produce also falls. So basically what, what's happened is aligned with kind of econ 101 type thinking. And furthermore, we got to remember that that prices can only fall so far because of those development charges and those land costs. Nobody's going to produce something if it if they lose money producing it. You know, if the plot of land costs you $250,000 just for the land and development charges are another 100,000. That's 350,000 right there. Nobody's going to turn around and, you know, sell a home for, you know, 400 450,000 cuz you're not going to make any money doing that. So there's a natural price floor that occurs because of the cost of land and the cost of taxes. We're always talking about wanting to get more supply in the market cuz we always figure that, you know, if you just have so much supply out there prices can't help but come down. But it sounds like you're saying that that's not true in this case, that even though there there seems to be a minimum price that they can't go below, and it's actually a pretty high price that people are still finding that unaffordable. Is there any hope of adding enough supply to get it down? Or do you, is it will that not work without lowering the taxes you're talking about as well? You have to go, okay, what's going to create the supply, right? Like if a magic genie just goes... Phew. And, and supply comes out, those prices will absolutely fall, right? But but what creates the supply? What creates the supply is builders and developers being able to supply that for a profit. And right now, taxes and land costs just don't allow that to happen. So to, to give an example, um, London, Ontario, my hometown, 20 years ago, development charges on a single detached home were $5,000. Today, they're $47,000, right? They've gone up about 800%. Um, so, you know, if your input costs are going up like 800%, you know, your, your development charges, land costs are also up about 800%. That creates a, a, a price floor. People aren't going to develop at that price. You might as well just sit and wait and, and see what happens. So the only way we're going to be able to create that supply is if those those taxes fall. Taxes are about 31% of the cost of development. So either those have to go down a lot or the cost of land magically has to go down a lot because otherwise... Um, Otherwise, nobody's going to produce. And that logic also applies to the not-for-profit sector, right? That, that, that even if you're building not-for-profit housing, you have to break even, right, by definition. So, so even if there's no profit motive involved whatsoever, just all of those costs layered on, you know, you, you have to pay uh, for the land, for the taxes, for the drywall, for the drywallers, and so on. All of that adds up. And if that all adds up to, you know, $700,000, let's say, at cost, then, you know, you know, you have to be able to qualify for a mortgage at that level. And nobody's really being able to do that at, at these interest rates. You described that maybe a genie could come and make land prices go down. And then, you know, that, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. What else could work to get land prices down? Yeah, so so there, there's a couple things. Uh, so first is just making more land available, which obviously kind of comes with its uh, with its own challenges. But secondly, is actually being able to use the land that we already have more efficiently. So that's you know, you and I, for instance, have talked about ab abolishing parking minimums. Well, what that does is that frees up land that would have been a parking space and create housing. You can, you know, use land more efficiently by, you know, legalizing fourplexes. So even if that plot of land, you know, that that say one tenth of an acre of land has the same price, if you're able to put four uh, units on that land instead of one, you've basically split the land cost four ways. So it's all about, you know, both the availability of land but how efficiently we're allowed to use that land, which is a, a function of a variety of different regulatory processes. You've described to me that some uh, developers are happy to just kind of wait it out and put their money into bonds. They can get a decent return. Um, why would they 
be if they're fine to sit and wait right now, why would they lower the prices if the taxes went down instead of like waiting until they can just pocket that extra money and say, we're happy to sit and wait on this, put our money in, into bonds and wait till you guys will pay what we wanted for it? Well, if it's a fairly competitive market, then basically what you're doing is ceding it to your competitor saying, OK, I'm, I'm fine just collecting these bonds and you guys over there, you, you make the money building the houses. So what people are going to do at any point in time going, OK, what, what's my set of available options and what's going to make, make the most sense for me? So you have to get to a point where, you know, building homes makes sense, where, you know, they can make money doing that. And, and yeah, they, you, they might time it a little bit, but obviously there's risk in that, right? If there's money to be made today, they're going to make that today. And, you know, in, in, in fact, we've seen in, in history, builders and developers tend to go the other way where, you know, if we look at the late 1980s, when uh, home prices started going up, they actually overbuilt, right? They actually had the other opposite problem where they all kind of gold rushed in and go, oh, wow, you know, where there's all this money here, we can't wait. They a- a- ended up overbuilding housing and actually crashing the market. So if there's money to be made, uh, builders and developers will go out there and make it. But but right now, just again, with, with land costs, Costs and, and and taxes um, and interest rates is just not profitable, particularly on the on the ownership market. I guess that's one of the benefits of getting those multiplexes or any m- missing middle homes in because it's kind of hard for for any person to get into the business of building ma- on mass, but like you can get smaller developers to come in to compete. So even if the bigger ones don't want to build right now, you still have some people who can build. So I guess that's a part of why we need these kinds of missing middle homes too. Well, on that, like, let's think of the math here for a second. Like, it might be hard right now to sell a home and apply for like $2 million, right? Which is a lot of money. But if you look at around the GTA, that's you know pretty much what things are going to go for, right? It's like, okay, I can't, you know, there's just not a market right now to build that many $2 million homes uh, on, on a piece of property. But could you build four, four, a fourplex and sell each of those units for $750,000 for $3 million? You might be able to do that. So that's why being able to build things like fourplexes is so important. Um, first of all, it allows us to use that land more efficiently, but it creates those options where it's like, yeah, I can't sell a $2 million, a large $2 million home, but maybe I could sell four smaller $750,000 homes on that same plot of land. And then you talked about the uh, rental market not being affected by this the same way that the ownership market is. Why is that? Yeah, well, so we look at a couple of things. So we haven't really addressed the sort of condo markets uh, yet. So the, the condo market has similar problems to the ownership market. Big difference there is the pre-construction uh, condo market uh, attracts all kinds of mom and pop investors. It's a very different field. And, you know, that's who usually provides your pre-construction financing. It's a lot of mom and pop investors who will provide the pre-construction financing and then take possession of the unit, maybe own it for a couple of years and rent it out, or maybe just flip it. Those guys are getting crushed right now because of those higher interest rates too, that those, um, uh, you know, oftentimes they already own two or three condo units. They're seeing those mortgages roll over, you know, at higher rates right now. So they're getting absolutely crushed. So the condo market is, is just dead. Like housing starts right now in the condo market are actually pretty good, but they represent past sales from a year or two ago, right? There's this lag between when the, the pre-construction sales happen uh, and when the starts happen, the shovels in the ground happen. Right now, sales are at levels that we haven't seen since the financial crisis and, you know, are at levels that we usually associate with the 1990s. So over the next couple of years, starts in that market are going to be absolutely dead just because nobody uh, is buying pre-construction condos right now. It's a it's a broke. It's a completely broken market because the, the homeowners can't afford it. But the bomb and pop investors are getting absolutely crushed by higher interest rates. And then when the ones who bought a couple of years ago, their homes are being started on right now. But then are they going to be able to actually close when it comes time for that? Well, that's that's a challenge. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, we're hearing stories, particularly on British Columbia, of the pre-con buyers just actually just disappearing. They lose their deposit? 
Yeah, they're lo- they're 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 actually just walking away, saying, you know, even though we paid down the twenty percent deposit, we're just going to walk away. We'll we'll eat that twenty percent loss. Oh my goodness! So that is absolutely uh, an issue and going to be an issue that of people just walking away from these deposits because they're just better off losing that twenty percent rather than than um, taking possession in a market of higher interest rates. So yeah, that is absolutely something worth watching. And going back to rentals, so you don't see this as a problem for rentals. Why? Yeah, so the rental market's a, a bit different because there you're, you know, it's, you're looking at big apartment buildings and and things like that. So it's it's big institutional investors, um, big REITs, you know, pension funds, that kind of thing. So it's it's big money. They're not as impacted uh, by the sort of day to day interest rate fluctuation. Like they're they're not as cash constrained to to put it. To put it differently, um, they are absolutely affected by higher interest rates. You know that it does um, that does weigh into their decisions. You know because it's not only higher cost for them, but also again, if you're a big pension fund, you're like, well, why am I going to build an apartment building and pay all these costs when I could just buy a, a 10 year uh, US T bill that's uh, you know got a five percent yield on it? I'm just to call my money in bonds. But why I, I think it might be okay is, is, first of all, I think there's a lot of residual demand out there for apartments, even even with the uh, reduction in international students and all that. I, I just think there's so much pent up demand out there. And then secondly, the government has made it fairly attractive to enter this market with things like eliminating the GST on purpose-built rentals, uh, providing uh, low interest rate loans, uh, the accelerated capital cost allowance changes. So that might be the one market that could be okay. It's you know gone up quite a bit over the last 10 years, you know, just a steady increase in starts. That one might be okay. I'm more optimistic about the rental market than I am about the other two. And that's what's so important to get on the market right now, especially given the the cost of rentals. When you talk about pent up demand of rentals, I keep thinking, oh, I guess it's people who are like stuck in their parents' home, stuck with roommates, stuck in bad relationships where they can't leave because they can't afford to, that kind of thing, right? That there's just a lot of demand for it. Well, absolutely. And if the ownership markets uh, or ownership starts are cratering, that's only going to fuel the need for more rentals, right? Because people got to live somewhere. Uh, and if it's not in ownership housing or, or, or you know, condo, whether it be condos or non-condos, they got to go somewhere. So we're going to need the, those rental spaces for them. But overall, if we add three, all three of those together, right, we've got these two ownership markets, which both look really bad for the next 18 to 24 months in Ontario. And the rental market, which just kind of looks okay, but not outstanding, right? The the provincial government here in Ontario says that we need to get, you know, 125,000 housing starts this year, 150,000 next year. I don't think we're going to hit 80,000, to be honest. Like, we're going to be nowhere near these numbers. We'll just keep so, counting you know, things as homes that aren't, and then we can get yeah, to those numbers just yeah, fine. You know, first, long-term care beds, uh, you know, college dorm rooms, baby turtles. I don't know what it is next. Yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's incredibly frustrating to me because, you know, we're seeing – the federal government coming out with housing targets, provincial government has these housing targets, and we're absolutely nowhere near any of them. And there doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency among our, our political class to say, hey, we've got a real problem here over the next couple of years. What are we going to do to fix it? Things can change. You know, maybe we'll get lucky. Interest rates will go down faster than anyone expects. Uh, you know, maybe we'll we'll start to see uh, municipal governments actually lower development charges for a change. You know, maybe the province will start to implement uh, some of the uh, recommendations from their own task force report. You know, there's it's possible. Uh, and I'm hopeful that, you know, the more you and I and others have these conversations, we can start affecting change. Because, again, I'm just yeah, you know, politicians are talking about the problem, but I don't think they really get how bad things are out there right now. Thanks so much for watching and listening. And thanks as always to our producer, Meredith Martin. If you have any burning housing or economics questions, please feel free to reach out to us at missingmiddlepodcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time.